Today we're here to talk about Juneteenth. So um, I believe in being very interactive. I'm gonna ask you, what do you know about Juneteenth? Anybody? Not a lot. Not a lot, okay. I saw a hand back there. Okay, enslaved people in Texas were set free. It became, it recently became a national holiday. We're going to talk about that today. Anything else? Anything else about Juneteenth? Those are really the high points about um, Juneteenth. Had any of you celebrated it before it became a national holiday? Anybody? Yeah. Are you, where are you from? Are you from Texas? I'm from Texas. Okay, which part of Texas? Uh, Waco. Okay, see, that's, that's why. We'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so a lot of people don't really know why, about Juneteenth and uh, a lot of people don't know why we celebrate Juneteenth. So I thought it'd be a great idea to talk a little bit about Juneteenth and talk about why is it something that, even though it seems like it should be a Texas thing, right? Um, but all of a sudden it's become a national holiday. And so kind of give you a little bit of a background on, on how that occurred and why that occurred and why I think that it's important that it occurred. All right, so my title of my presentation is Free at Last, Juneteenth, the United States Second Day of Independence, the Second Independence Day. So we're gonna talk about a few things uh, and there will be a pop quiz at the end. No, not today, not today, <laughs> not today. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the some of the stages <clears throat> that uh, were great markers for progression towards the second day of independence in the United States. So we're gonna look at the background. I'm an early American historian, so we're gonna go pretty far back and look at some of the beginnings um, and groundwork that laid the way for us to have this recognition and this value in Juneteenth as not just a, a regional celebration, not just a state celebration, but a national celebration. So we're gonna look at um, the roots of African Americans' quest for freedom. We're gonna talk a little bit about the fight for freedom during the American Civil War era. Then we're going to talk about um, some of the things that happens when the slaves are freed, when um, emancipation happens, not just in some areas, but collectively across the South. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about, so why does it even matter? So let's talk about hope deferred. What, when something is deferred, what does that mean? Like is that, what's that? I'm old, I can't hear good. <laughs> delayed? It's like it's delayed. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really happen at the time or the speed that you think it's going to happen. So when we look at African Americans' quest for freedom and we couple it with the developments in this country regarding the Revolutionary War, we'll see that African Americans were very, very hopeful that change would come. By the time we get to the American Revolutionary War, roughly slavery had been fully instituted in the United States for a little over 100 years. We had this point about maybe a little over two million enslaved peoples in the South at this point, and that number is going to grow. Slavery in America is unique for a number of ways. One of the things that makes slavery in America very, very unique is that in most places, especially where there were a lot of slaves, like in the Caribbean area because of sugar production, slave populations, they aren't sustained by way of natural increase. The way that this, the slave population is stabilized is because of the slave trade. But in America, we have the very opposite happen. Even though roughly only about 5% of the slaves that came out of Africa ended up in North America, the population would grow, increase exponentially from the time of the first 
enslaved or possibly enslaved people arrived in 1619 in Virginia to the very end of enslavement in 1865. So when we get to 1865, that number where we are at the American Revolutionary War is going to almost double. We'll be at four million enslaved peoples, in, most of them in the South at that point. So, so the hope for freedom doesn't really come at the time and in the ways that people had hoped during the Revolutionary War. But African Americans never lost their hope and they were a very vibrant part and they played a very important role in the quest for American freedom, hoping that American freedom would mean also their own personal freedom from enslavement. Now, there, there are uh, quite a few African Americans that um, played a role in the, in, the, in the American Revolutionary War on both sides, and we'll talk a little bit about them. But I just wanted to give you some big examples, and I want to start with something familiar, because most people know who, if they don't know anything, they know who Christmas Addicts was. Who's Christmas Addicts? Where do we know him from? He had a TV show. He was an influencer. No? Christmas Addicts. Okay, let me help you out. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm here, I'm here to help you out. I'm glad I didn't bring my, my pop quiz with me. All right, so Christmas Addicts was actually present at what was called um, the Boston Massacre. Okay? Now, now I, we got to stop right now. Because it was called the Boston Massacre. How many people were killed? 5 people. Is that a massacre? No. Okay. So there was a little bit of propaganda going on because we had a group of Americans in Boston. They were all hyped up and ready for a revolution to happen. And so when the Boston Gazette um, published the news story about the Boston event, it, they published it in, in the spring of 1775 and they called it the Boston Massacre. The first person that was killed in this, in this encounter between Americans and British Redcoats was actually Christmas Addicts. And he was an interesting character in early American history. He was a, a mulatto, he was a seaman, he was a runaway slave, he did all the stuff, right? And he was very upset, as were many Bostonians, because of the occupation of the British in Boston. And those British redcoats, they weren't just soldiering, they were moonlighting on the side, taking little jobs in Boston. And it was pushing out people like Christmas addicts and other Bostonians from having all of the access to, um, to economic opportunity. And so that really was at the core of this disagreement between the Redcoats and those uh, Bostonians. And so um, there was some bickering going on and one of the Redcoats lost his lost his head and fired into the crowd. And when the smoke cleared, about five people were dead and Christmas Addicts was among them. And there was a whole big hoopla. They gave him a, a great, beautiful, big funeral and there were speeches given. And all of this took place to hype Americans up, to make them really, really feel that the British were oppressing them in a lot of different ways and that it was the right thing to fight in this revolutionary war. And so all of this is part of the propaganda that, propaganda that builds momentum for Americans to get involved in the war. Now, Peter Salem is probably someone you've probably never, never heard of, but he, he represents the more than 5,000 African Americans who fought on the side of the, of the Patriots during the Revolutionary War. So we call the Americans uh, the Patriots, the, the Redcoats are the, the mean guys with the bright red suits, all right? And so Peter Salem is famous because he was at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which really didn't play, take place at Bunker Hill. It took place at a hill a little, bit a little bit further away called Breed's Hill. But Bunker Hill, I think it has a more romantic name or something to it. So we called it Bunker Hill, or somebody wrote it down incorrectly. And um, it went into the history books, and you know, now it's a thing. So anyway, Peter Salem is famous because at the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Americans were greatly, greatly um, outnumbered. They were outpowered. 
and yet they were able to stand toe to toe with the British at this battle. Now, this happens um, in June of 1775. The Revolution, Revolutionary War hasn't even started yet. But the Americans, again, they're, they're, they're becoming very incensed with the type of control that the British government is trying to exert over them, especially with taxation. You know that saying, taxation without representation. Um, and so um, when the uh, British attack occurs here at Bunker's Hill, the British are really surprised because the Americans really give them a hard time at this battle. And in fact, the commanding officer, a man by the name of Major Pitcairn, was killed by Peter Salem. So Peter Salem walked away as the hero of uh, the Battle of Bunker's Hill, AKA Breed's Hill, or vice versa. So African Americans played a very, very important role in supporting the war. There are a number of reasons that they supported the war. Some of them supported the war because they they really believed in those Republican political uh, that Republican political ideology about the government owing having a responsibility to the governed rather than vice versa. This idea of uh, personal liberty and freedom and access to uh, the political process, being a part of the political process. And so these African Americans were among those who really um, embraced these ideas and embraced that ideology and they really believed what the principles of the American Revolutionary was really preaching to them at the time. So some of them fought in the war and supported the Patriots for that reason. Others, now I know we have this image of all of the Americans being really, really gung-ho about fighting in the Revolutionary War. One of the biggest problems that George Washington had during the war was trying to get people to come to battle and fight. He never knew if he was gonna have enough soldiers. He never knew if he was gonna have enough equipment. He never knew if he was gonna win the next battle or the war was gonna be over. And so what uh, uh, some of the um, slaveholders would do, instead of going to fight the war, they would sign up their slaves to go fight in their place and give them their freedom, promise them their freedom. And so that was another incentive. But at the core of this, regardless of why these African Americans were fighting on the side of the, of the Americans or the, or the Patriots, at the core of the, the real core of that motivation was freedom. This idea that this was an opportunity for me to have personal freedom and hopefully to have rights and privileges in this brand new country. Now, there weren't just people who sided with the Americans. There were also African Americans who sided with the British and they're called loyalists and probably some other names if you lived back in the day. There um, was a situation where the last of the royal governors in Virginia Lord Dunsmore decided that he was in trouble, that things were heating up in the colonies and it didn't look too good for him because remember, his, his base of support is 2,000 miles away across the Atlantic Ocean in England. And so he needed some support and some protection. So what he issued in November of 1775 is a document that's called um, Dunmore's Proclamation. And basically what he promised was that if you were an indentured servant, and we still had some indentured servants in the country, people who would work from between four to seven years and then get their freedom. If you were an indentured servant or if you were a slave, if you joined with the British, you fought against the Americans, then guess what? You could get your freedom. Now, I don't know, they didn't have social media. I don't know how many, I don't know how those black folk found out, but they found out. Okay, I don't know what was going on. I don't know if they were you know, sending messages via pigeons or something. But what happens is, Dunsmore really was hopeful that he'd get a handful of, of slaves and indentured servants to show up and support him. And what happens is, he gets somewhere around 45, 30 to 45,000 slaves start running from South Carolina. Now, if you know anything about South Carolina, if I was a slave in South Carolina, I would have run too because it was the worst place to be a slave. The work, the work was arduous, it was horrible. Um, it was a terrible, terrible place, probably more than anywhere else in the South to be a slave was in South Carolina. And we'll talk a little bit why about that later. So all of these slaves show up, Dunsmore gets run out of town. He's on a ship 
and on a little island off the coast of Virginia, there's nowhere, he doesn't have the resources to take care of this many people. So unfortunately, even though they were seeking freedom, what happened to a lot of those African Americans who were fleeing from enslavement was rather than, than getting free, physical freedom as they saw it, a lot of them died because of uh, poor sanitation, there weren't enough uh, resources, not enough food and clean water for them. So a good portion of those individuals died. But there, there was also a good portion of them that survived and fought along with the British. And so as the war progressed, by the time we get to 1781, the Battle of, of Yorktown has happened, and it was the last major battle of the American Revolutionary War. And it's obvious that the, the underdog, the Americans, um, they routed the British and were able to defeat the British. And so the British is making their exit plan, right? And so they are going to a certain extent uphold that promise of giving freedom to those loyalists. And so roughly about 3,000 loyalists who could show and verify that they had been signed up to serve with the British. First, they migrated out of the South up to New York and from New York, most of them were taken to Nova Scotia. What do you know about Nova Scotia? It's in Canada, so how do you think it feels? It's real cold. I wouldn't mind being there today. But we're talking people, people from the heart of the South going to somewhere very, very cold, harsh conditions that they aren't accustomed to. So of that 3,000, most of them would not stay in Nova Scotia. A lot of them would migrate to England, about, roughly about four or 500 of them would migrate to England. Some of them would go to a place in Africa, Africa called Sierra Leone and start a new life for themselves there. But unfortunately, a lot of those individuals that had sided with the British hoping for freedom, their hope was deferred greatly. Some of them ended up being transported into the Caribbean and re-enslaved. So in that, that journey toward freedom for African Americans, it meant a lot of different things. Sometimes it, it almost seemed like it was a flip of the coin. You may get your freedom, but you may end up either, either dead or re-enslaved. But for African Americans who had known, for the most part, many of them, nothing but a life of enslavement, um, brutality and a harsh life, the quest and the desire for freedom was so strong that they were willing to take their chance to fight for it, to die for it if necessary. So we're gonna get past the sad stuff. So the Revolutionary War is over, we got a brand new nation. And so that 5,000 or so African Americans and other African Americans who heard about this birth of this new nation and they're talking about things like inalienable rights, all men are created equal, that we have access to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and it's for everybody. And they thought, well, I'm a everybody, so it's for me too. And so when the new nation is birthed, there was a lot of hope that things were gonna change, that in this new nation, there would be a place for African Americans to exist along other peoples and enjoy the same freedoms and help to build this country. But that isn't exactly what happened. Some of those ones who fought as um, patriots were freed, um, but then others weren't. And so in Massachusetts, we had something very, very interesting. We had a fellow by the name of Quack Walker and an old lady by the name of Elizabeth Freeman. And they really believed these principles about um, the liberty and the rights and the freedoms, especially in states in the North in Massachusetts where the population, except for in New York, was relatively low. And so their expectation was, okay, I heard about this new, we have a new state constitution that says that all people are created equal, all people should be free. And so you know what they did? They didn't fight for their freedom with a gun, they fought for their freedom through the court system. And they had um, white American patrons who supported them and represented them in the courts. And so we had a number between the end of the Revolutionary War, roughly in 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed, and the end of the decade, we had a number of people like Quark Walker and Elizabeth Freedom, who, Freeman, who engaged in um, what was called these freedom suits, fought for their freedom through the court system, 
sometimes appeal after appeal, ultimately won, but they didn't just win for themselves. Their victory was a victory really for all African Americans, especially those living in the North, because what it did was it incentivized those, those revolutionary war leaders and these leaders of the new country to really be reflective and said, you know, if we really fought to create a new nation, if we really fought based on these principles of liberty and freedom and equity, maybe we sh it shouldn't be just lip service. Maybe we should make it a reality. And so beginning in Massachusetts, Massachusetts be be began, was the first of the states in the North um, in the new nation to dismantle their slavery system. And as they did that, we saw other states in the North would do the same. Now, on the other side, it was a little bit easier to dismantle a slavery system in the North than it was in the South. In the North, um, slavery wasn't that much of a, a vibrant part of the social and the economic and the political structure as it was in the South because of um, economic activity in the South that centered around cash crop production where you needed a massive amount of labor. We call it labor intensive um, cash crop production where you need a lot of bodies working really hard and you don't pay them anything so you can make lots of money. I was just saying it sounds like my job, but it doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> and so ultimately in the North, we'll see the, the, that slavery will uh, be dismantled and we'll see that there is hope. African-Americans find this hope that slavery can become a thing of the past, even if it's a limited thing of the past. So the hope for freedom wasn't completely deferred, but it didn't happen in the scale that African-Americans had hoped. There were still a lot of African-Americans that were enslaved in the South and would remain enslaved in the South until 1865. Any questions? You can ask, yeah, sure. As far as those slaves that were put in um, the wars in place of the slave owners, they were given the, the ability to be free. Now, were they able to get like some type of certificate to show, hey, I've saved in the war, this is my freedom papers, and were they able to live any other way? So in the, in the, that's a good question. So in the, in the North, they already had a system of what we call manumission, where a lot of times, um, in the North because of the fact that they didn't have that many slaves. And so oftentimes, you know, we have this picture of slavery being a situation where um, you have the, the big plantation house and the slaves are over there in their slave quarters. In the North, it wasn't really like that. A lot of times, if you had a slave, it probably was one or two of them. Oftentimes, you would get the dregs of the slaves if there's such a thing. You get the leftover slaves, like the kids. And so that was something you raised them up in the family. Think about Phyllis Whitley. Wheatley, okay? So someone that was trained up, oftentimes um, they would be a personal servant. Sometimes they would be uh, trained up to have a craft. They would live in the house with you. That was, you know, that was your person. And so you had a very different relationship than if you, between a slave and a master, if you were enslaved maybe in the South where there were a lot of slaves and you didn't have that real close proximity and that interaction. So oftentimes these, uh, these masters in the North, a lot of times, and even some of them in the South would say, you know what, owning and selling people is probably not a good idea. I'm about to die. I want to go to heaven. I'm getting rid of my slaves. And so they would manumit them. And so basically there would be a legal process um, where you would grant them their freedom and they were free to live wherever they wanted to live. Now, there's a caveat to that. There was not a lot of opportunity for, for African Americans, you know, even in the North. A lot of them, even our friend Peter Salem, ended up in a poor house um, and lived a, a pretty miserable life for the rest of it. He was free, but that's just about it. He was just free. All right, so another way that African Americans pursued freedom in their, in their quest was freedom was um, engaging in slave revolts. And this is a scary thing uh, for slaveholders because the last thing, that's, that's the thing that would uh, make you wake up in the middle of the night with the shakes, is the idea that you had slaves and those slaves were plotting to kill you and run off uh, 
poisoning was uh, the crime of preference uh, for killing your, your masters. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was a fearful thing, especially, remember I talked about South Carolina. South Carolina was an interesting place because in most of the places in the colonies, when they developed a slavery system, it was a gradual process. In South Carolina, most of the people who came from South Carolina came from Barbados, where they produced sugar, where they already had a slave system. So when they came, they came with a slave system intact and they invested in rice production, which is very, very arduous work. And so they brought in a lot of slaves in, in South Carolina and it was a, a very, very harsh life. But then by the time we get into um, the 1700s, we already have, um, 1730s, we already have um, a majority slave population in South Carolina. And so it was probably one of the hardest places to live as a slave, but one of the most dangerous places to live as a slave holder because you had so many slaves that you had to control them. So one of the things that happens in 1831 is an example of a slave revolt. Probably you heard of a guy by the name of Ned Turner. He was something of a, of a religious leader and he believed that he was called to free his people. And so basically what he engages in is this, he, he gathers up some slaves to join with him and they, they go in a killing spree and they basically kill about 55 to 60, 60 or so uh, whites before they're cap they're, they'll be eventually be captured and, and um, executed. But because of the fact that this, this slave revolt almost was successful, this attempt, they were trying to get to Florida where, where uh, the Spanish were and find freedom, but they never get there. Now, one of the things with these slave revolts is this, the, the backlash from the slave revolts will be very, very harsh. And so what we see in places like South Carolina, um, where we had this majority population of slaves, there would also be the harshest of slave laws implemented. Because here you had a population where um, the, the free white population was probably only a half of what, a half or less of what the slave population was. Probably two, two for every, two blacks for, two black enslaved peoples for every one white slave, one white free person. And so the idea was harsh control. And so some of the rigid laws that we see were in, in South Carolina. And they got even more rigid after 1831. Now the thing is, you know, we have these images of what slavery was like. Slavery was very different depending on where you were enslaved, like in South Carolina. But it was also very different um, if you were on a plantation as opposed to a farm. And a lot of times we think of slaves as, as you know, being, being um, housed and, and controlled in one area. But up until um, Nat Turner's revolt, they had a lot of freedom to move around. And so they would, they would get a little document that they could say that they could go over to Farmer Brown's and they could go over, maybe they were a skilled slave, maybe they were a blacksmith or something like that. And their slaveholder may contract them out to uh, go work at another uh, plantation or farm to work. And sometimes, you ever heard of slaves being able to buy their freedom? Well, if you work for free, how do you buy your freedom? I'm still trying to figure it out. Anyway how you buy your freedom, because the slave experience was, was it's, it was a very varied, varied thing. And so sometimes there was some exchange in terms of monies given to slaves if they, if they performed well, a reward for performing well, a reward for being a skilled, maybe you were a skilled carpenter and you could go over and work somewhere and you did a great job and the, you've been contracted out by your master and your master might give you a little bit of money and then you could uh, save uh, some of that money. Sometimes uh, these slaves were very resourceful. They would be hunters. Sometimes they had their own little gardens and chickens and they would sell those um, to, to their plantation owner. And so there was, it, it, it seems kind of weird that there was this, this commercial interaction and relationship, but slavery was a very, very um, complex system. And that's why it was so difficult to dismantle it. And one of the reasons um, a civil war had to occur to do that. Any questions? Uh, two questions. Sure. That's a, that's a, you're gonna ask me a date question. I don't answer dates. Okay, so, so 1781. So 1780, they've written their constitution. By 1781, we start to see 
the, the uh, freedom suits. By 1782, a lot of those people who were winning those suits were, were, were freed, and the, and, the, and the slavery system is crumbling, not just in Massachusetts, but in other, other, other northern states. That's a great question. Um, you say they save up enough money to say, okay, hey, how much am I worth? All right, well, here you go. This is what I have. And then they say, well, you didn't really earn that money. How did you get that money? You stole it. Like, what, yeah, yeah, what yeah. kept that from happening? Is so, it, so there's a book you have to read. It's called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, and it's free. Okay, you can get it. You can get it free from I think it's Gutenberg Books or something. Just look it up. You got to read this story because it will blow your mind what slavery was like. So sometimes um, these enslaved peoples, uh, especially the skilled ones, uh, would save up money, enough money to, to buy their buy themselves, buy their kids some freedom. But it's just like if you are a valuable slave, you're a blacksmith, you're a silversmith, you're a carpenter, you're a great cook. Your, your value will be high. And so every time you, I would say, you know what? I'm a slaveholder right now. I know I don't look like one, but I'm a slaveholder today. And you say, you know what? I want to buy my freedom. And I've been, I've been saving up this money for the last seven years. And I have all this money. Because you told me seven years ago that if I get $500, I could buy my freedom. I'm like, you know what? Inflation. You cost, you cost 1000 now. And so sometimes that, that would happen where, where, where you wouldn't be able um, to to buy your freedom because you were too valuable or the slaveholder just didn't want to tell you to allow you to buy yourself. Now, when we get into the, the, the 19th century, I'm gonna throw out a date, you're gonna be really impressed with me. By the time we get to the 1830s, a lot of things are happening. America is changing. We're going through a market revolution. We have the first real um, large phase of immigration coming in. We have uh, a lot of uh, Irish people coming in. Uh, I'm part Irish, I know you could tell. Um, so a lot of my ancestors start, started to, to come in to America. They were dirt poor, there was a potato famine, but the potato was their staple uh, food. And so these people were starving, they just got on a ship, came to America, and wherever they got off the ship, that became home. We had a lot of German people coming to America as well. So some different groups, not just from the British Isles at this point, uh, and some other places in, in um, um, Europe. But the thing was, they're coming in, in larger numbers. So demographically, America is becoming even more diverse, and it's changing. How do people feel about change? No bueno. We don't like it. It's scary. So it's a scary time in America. Not only that, the America is growing. We're starting to expand westward. We're starting to industrialize. We're in the first phase of industrialization. Um, we're starting to urbanize. Now, cities aren't, aren't huge like Houston yet, but we're starting to get large cities. And with large cities, you get crime, you get, you get filth, you get crowded cities, you get disease. Before this time period, before the 1830s, Americans lived so far apart that we didn't get a lot of the epidemics like in Europe. But now that in the 1830s, we're, we're living closer together in cities, we're working in factories, all of that is changing. So again, how do people react to change? It's scary. And so what we have is one of the responses is people start to engage in revivalism. There's a huge revival movement in America in the 1830s. It starts in New York in an area called the, they call it the, the revival fires were so hot, they called it the burned out uh, area, the burned out region. And so with this revivalism, one, one thing that happens when people find religion, they find morality, right? And they start to think more carefully about what's really good and what's beneficial, not just for myself, but for my community and for my country. And so people started to reevaluate. And one of the things that, that's birthed out of that revivalism, there's a lot of stuff that's birthed out of it. One of them is the abolition movement. People start to say, you know, we, we, in the North, we, we, freed, we freed slaves. We, we, we ended slavery for the most part. New York had a lot of slaves, so most of the slaves in New York didn't get freed. They had something called gradual 
uh, emancipation. That means at a certain at, um, at a certain point, people, if they were young, when they got to be like 25 years old, you would be freed. And so it was very gra very very gradual, very very slow process. And so by by 1827. Um, Roughly everybody who was in the north that had formerly been enslaved was free, okay? But in the south, that population is growing. There are a lot of people who are groaning under the weight of enslavement. And so there were people in the north. James Fortin was actually a very, very wealthy guy. He was born shortly, about 20 years before the Revolutionary War, and made a lot of money making sales. Who knew? <laughs> I should have tried that. Um, making sales. And so he had his own business and he used a lot of his own money to advocate for abolition. He was a free man. But African Americans in the North knew that even if they were free in the North, as long as there were African Americans that weren't free, that were unfree, they were, their freedom was limited. And so they fought for freedom. You probably remember Frederick Douglass. He's, he's probably one of the most uh, famous. Um, abolitionists, these were people who, who fought against uh, slavery, but they, the interesting thing is some of these people didn't just um, fight against slavery and um, uh, promote the abolition movement in America. The abolition movement was an international movement, okay? Probably one of the first really, um, we would say, global social movements of the time period. And so Frederick Douglass and some of these other individuals fought for freedom on a, a whole nother scope, not just in America, but to end, um, end slavery um, in, uh, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, and in the idea of, of people being enslaved um, throughout the world. And so Harriet Tubman, um, very, very famous. She was a fugitive slave. A lot of these people were people who had, who had escaped um, enslavement in the north, in the south, to go live in the south, in the north. But yet they fought to eliminate the entire system of slavery. And so, for I, when I grow up, I want to be like Harriet. Tub well, I don't want to be a slave though. Harriet Tubman, because of the fact that she was like the Rambo of the 19th century. She escaped out of uh, slavery. She traveled back to the South about 17 times. She was a master of disguises. She, freed, she liberated her entire family, a lot of friends and acquaintances. She, freed, she was instrumental in 70 slaves gaining their freedom. And the thing was, she had been injured by her master and she would have these blackouts and there was nothing she could do about it. Now, I, I, I have not figured out how she was never caught, but she was very, very successful. And during the Civil War, she actually fought in the Civil War and was a spy in the Civil War. So yes, yeah, she was Rambo. Um, Sojourner, Sojourner Truth is another important uh, um, one of these black abolitionists who was also a fugitive slave. And she played a very important role because she not only fought for freedom for African Americans, but freedom for women. She was a great advocate for women to have the right uh, suffrage rights. All right. So we had, um, by the time we get to the end uh, of um, the period of slavery, something interesting is happening. A lot of slaves had formerly been con uh, uh, in this area of the South. Well, because of cotton production, that became a big economic uh, um, activity in the South by the 1830s. Most of, those, most of those slaves are being sold into these areas, and a lot of them will, will end up in East Texas. Cotton production was a big deal in East Texas, some rice protection as well. And so this is when slavery became its harshest because there was so much money to be made via the internal slave trade that you know when you think of slavery, parents being sold apart, uh, couples being sold apart, children being sold away from their parents and vice versa. This is when slavery got its ugliest from the period from the 1830s to the end of slavery in, the, in 1865. So it was a horrible life, a life in which um, a slave family was very, very um, threatened. When um, we get to 1861, the Civil War breaks out in April, April of 1861. You would have thought that, especially the North, would have utilized African Americans who were willing, ready, wanting to fight. But remember, just because we were fighting this war to dismantle slavery, it didn't mean that people had enlightened ideas about African Americans. And there were very racist perceptions about African Americans, that they, they wouldn't know what to do on the battlefield, that they might eat the gun or something, I don't know. 
But um, it wasn't until um, the Emancipation Proclamation um, was issued, was, was written up. It was originally the rough draft of it was written in September of 1862. It will go into law in January of 1863 that at that same time, this is when we start to see um, Abraham Lincoln change some of his racist perceptions of African Americans and African Americans will be allowed to go into the battlefield. And that um, Massachusetts 54th Infantry was uh, the first ones to go out and fight. And if you've ever seen, it's an old movie now, it was a new movie when I was young and didn't have gray hair, but it's an old movie now. It's called Glory with Denzel Washington. That, that movie is based on the true story of the 54th uh, Massachusetts Division and what they, so, you know, go find it and look at it. You'll learn a lot of history. So the freedom process was a gradual process, right? So we had people fighting for freedom since the Revolutionary War. We had people fleeing for freedom, running away from the South. We had people fighting for the system of enslavement to be broken and done away with via either those early freedom suits after the Revolutionary War or via the abolition movement during the 1830s in that period of reform. But it's in 1865 that the complete process is done. We have the Emancipation Proclamation did not free everybody. It only freed slaves that were in the rebelling states. So those 11 states that were part of the Confederacy, their slaves were free. Abraham Lincoln was nobody's fool, okay? He had some border states. They were Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Those were slave states. They were right in the middle between the North and the South, but they stayed loyal to the North when those 11 states in the South seceded from the Union. And Abraham Lincoln did not want to make those people bad. And so even though this war is going to be redefined as a war to end slavery, a war against slavery, what he did was he issued the Emancipation Proclamation and it limited freeing slaves. It limited emancipating slaves. Only if you were a slave in one of those rebelling states were you freed. All of the other slaves that were in those, in those border states, they weren't freed until December 8th, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was added to the Constitution that officially ended slavery. So now we come to Juneteenth. I'm almost done. When did I say the Emancipation Proclamation was issued? 1863. When did we find out about the good news in Texas? It took a while. No cell phones, right? It took a while because if you, if you look at where the war was being fought, what the Union did was the Mississippi River was, of course, important. And so it cut off like Texas. Texas is west of the Mississippi River, right? And so when we fought, when, when, the, when the Union fought the war and, def and began the process of defeating the, the uh, Confederates, what they did, they had a plan called the Anaconda Plan. What's the Anaconda? Is, okay, what, how does it kill its prey? It wraps around them. And so that's exactly, that was the strategy of the, of the Union, to wrap around. So what they did, they did a circular motion. There was fighting in the Eastern Theater. There was fighting um, in the border. It sucked to be in the border states because some of the worst battles were there. And then along the uh, Mississippi River. And so when we, when we took Vicksburg, I think in 1863, basically the war, war was starting to, uh, 1864, the war was starting to wind down at that point. Because now the South no longer had access to Texas and the resources in Texas. One of the interesting things that a lot of slaveholders had done because Texas was so far west and most of the fighting during the Civil War was localized um, around the Mississippi River into the, in the Eastern Theater, close to Virginia and the Carolinas and the, in those areas, what they did was those who could afford it, they packed up their slaves when things started to get hot and dicey and they moved them into Texas. So much so that when the good news arrived in Texas, there were roughly about 250,000 slaves just in Texas alone. Because it was a safe place 
to take your slaves if you could afford it, if you had the resources to get them there. And so when the good news arrived, there were a lot of happy uh, formerly enslaved people who find out that not only am I free, I've been free for a long time. I've been free for over about two and a half years because of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so there's gonna be a lot of, of celebration. There's gonna be a lot of happiness. So much so that we get a holiday to celebrate Juneteenth. And so a lot of barbecuing, a lot of what we call soul food, and a lot of um, the food that's chosen for um, Juneteenth, it goes back to, to times of slavery. Food was very important um, a part of the slave culture. And so a lot of this food, you know, when you have that big family reunion, everybody brings a, a, a pot and a, and a, and a bowl and, and something real good and greasy and tasty. Um, and it's very communal. You, you invite everybody from the neighborhood and, you know, people packing up plates and all that kind of stuff. That is a relic from enslavement. A lot of the cooking that was done was very communal. Coming together and bringing your little bit and my little bit and putting it together and sharing out that food. And so that's a very important part of the celebration of Juneteenth. What else is important? What, do you, what is common about these two pictures? Red, why do we, you gotta have red, you have watermelon, red soda water, that's what, that's what we call it in the South. Red soda water to drink, and you have some barbecue sauce that's red, you ever have, probably have some red beans and some other red things. Red was a very, very important part of this ritual of celebrating Juneteenth, primarily because um, it goes back to um, African culture, actually, red is a very, um, is very important symbolically um, in, in um, their, their uh, in spiritual symbolism. Um, and so in any time uh, that African-Americans get together and we celebrate these types of activities like Juneteenth, there's always gonna be something red, a lot of red things there. One of the interesting things that happens is, is this idea of celebrating communally. Now, when you were a slave, you basically wore, you got two uh, outfits and a pair of shoes a year. Think about what you look like by the time, you got that in January, what you look like by the time uh, March rolled around. You didn't look too good. You were, basically, you wore rags. And so one of the important celebrations in Juneteenth was you were to get dressed up in your very best clothing. The other thing that you did was you found, um, again, that communal activity coming, that coming together to celebrate the freedom that we've been fighting for since the Revolutionary War and even before that. And so one of the things, you ever heard of Yates High School over by U of H? Yates, Jack Yates was a minister. And one of the things that he did um, shortly after the Civil War was he did a collection, gathered up about $1,000 and bought some land so that there would be a public space for African Americans to celebrate Juneteenth. And that space, you can still go visit it today. It's called Emancipation Park, um, right on the um, edge of downtown down there. So why does Juneteenth matter? The struggle for freedom has been a struggle that didn't just start with the Revolutionary War. It was a struggle that started when African Americans were loaded into the belly of ships and crossing and then those miserable, miserable conditions across um, the Middle Passage and their journey from Africa to North America or the Caribbean. It was uh, a journey that was fraught with uh, lots of disappointments, um, lots of pain, lots of loss, and even death. We see the culmination of it during the civil rights movement when we're fighting for not just the right to be free, but the right to breathe in America, to have the same opportunities as others, to play a role in the America that we actually helped to build. So Juneteenth does matter. Juneteenth is important. And it's not just a Texas thing, it's a people thing. And in your studies, if you look at social movements like the civil rights movement, what you'll see is those basic principles are principles that this nation was built upon. Those basic principles of equality, those basic principles of equity, of freedom, of liberty, are things that this nation was actually built upon. So it is no, it is, it is no wonder that in, um, in the summer of 
19, uh, uh, 2021 that Joe Biden made um, Juneteenth, not just a regional holiday or a state holiday as it had been since the 80s, but made it a national holiday because it represents the, the, the fulfillment of a dream, of a goal for freedom, and freedom at a level that this nation had never really experienced or ever lived up to those principles on which it was built way back from the revolutionary era. So Juneteenth is important because when one group of people or a sector of society is free, that freedom is spontaneous and, it, and it's contagious and it grows. So the, when we can free one group, we free all groups. And that freedom can spread not just from America, but around the world.